Well, good morning, church. All right, I like it. We're getting better at that in the mornings here. So excited to have you here this morning worshiping with us, whether you're here in person or you're online this morning. Hopefully you're wide awake and enthusiastic. I know uh, we're missing some of our youth. They didn't uh, recover so well from our late night last night. So uh, we thank you all for your prayers. Uh, for those of us who went to Winter Jam last night, we had a good time and we're hoping uh, to get you some pictures here in the coming days on our Facebook page. And hopefully next week we'll have them up on the screen so you guys can get a sneak peek. Uh, at what we got to enjoy. And next year, if that's something you're interested in, we'll always invite you to come and be a part of that. It was a great time uh, to just be out and be a part of the youth of the church and investing in them. So uh, I just want to go over a few things this morning. Hopefully when you came in, you grabbed a bulletin. Uh, this has a lot of different information of what's coming up uh, here at the church, as well as this morning is communion. And so hopefully you got a communion cup. If you didn't, you can raise your hand and hopefully we'll get you one in here in just a few minutes if that's something you didn't grab on your way in. Uh, but this morning, a little later in the service, we are going to be uh, partaking in communion together this morning. And so uh, in the bulletin, you'll notice uh, that Monday is a busy day. Uh, tomorrow morning uh, at 9 a.m., if you're free and available and want to come and fellowship as we pack brown bags for some of the students in our community, uh, you're welcome to come out and join us on the assembly line of putting these bags together and praying over them as they uh, get prepared to head out and get put into the hands of some of these students in our community who might not have meals going into the weekend. And so uh, we'd welcome you to come and be a part of that. And then a little bit later in the afternoon at 2 o'clock, the ladies, the Dorcas Circle is going to be meeting here at the church. And so you're welcome, as always, to come out and to be a part of that. And uh, one thing that is a deadline for Dorcas Circle this morning is they were collecting uh, names for the college and ministry uh, for any students who are in college, anybody who's serving uh, locally or abroad, uh, so that they can uh, put together some things for them. So if you have a name and you haven't submitted it yet, uh, you can do so to Diane. She's back there in the corner waving her hand in the green. Um, you can submit that to her uh, here today and so that they could get added to that list. Um, I know they would appreciate it as they pray over these college students and those who are serving and I think those who receive uh, the correspondence and anything from them would appreciate it as well. Um, later this week, um, Friday, uh, the youth is going to be heading to camp. And so after church this morning, if you have a student who signed up to go to camp with us, if you could at least send one parent down to the youth room, last room on the left, uh, we're just going to have a, a quick meeting, go over some last minute details, answer some questions if you have any. Um, and then this Friday, we're going to meet here at 4.30. Uh, to get checked in and to pack and to load up and get ready to go. And so I would invite you guys as a church, be praying for us. Uh, you'll see some of the bags out there. Hopefully all the treat bags are getting returned if you took one. Uh, something I've done uh, at our last church and throughout the years as we've gone to camp in that, if you're free and you want to come out and pray with us before we leave, I'd invite you guys to come out and to be a part of that. It means a lot to us as leaders who go, and it means a lot to the students and then you get to come out and see who's going and be a part of that as well. And so we'd invite you, if you want to come out at uh, 4.45, 5 o'clock, you don't have to be right here at 4.30 to check in with us. But if you want to come and pray with us and send us off, uh, we'd love to have you come and to join us for that. One last thing there you'll see, men of the church, as always, you're invited to come out. Uh, this Saturday is the men's breakfast. And so it's going to be at final approach at 8 a.m., and so we'd invite you guys to come out for a time of food, fellowship, uh, devotion, and just spend some time together that morning, uh, just getting to know one another and talking through uh, life and what's going on. And then as always, uh, we want to invite you, stick around afterwards. Uh, we have Sunday school for each and every one of you to come and to be a part of and get plugged into. If you're not plugged into one yet, we just had two new ones start last week. And so if you wanted to check those out, they're in the bulletin. Uh, and it lists their meeting locations. And so the two new one is uh, the 30 Life Principles here in the sanctuary, and then the seven churches of Revelation at the end of the hallway on the right-hand side. And so again, if you've not checked out a Sunday school, uh, I would encourage you to do so. You could look at one of those or join one of the many that are existing already that you could be a part of, and we'd love to have you to join us during that time. And so this morning I'd ask, uh, as we get ready to worship, would you pray with me this morning? God, we are just so grateful for the things that we see you doing and the ways that we are working, the opportunities that we've had to uh, gather together, and the many more that we look forward to here in the future. 
Now we just pray, as always, that you would just continue to lead and guide us as a church, that you would just continue to build us together as a community of believers on fire for you, that we might be ready and prepared to, to go out and be your hands and feet here in this community. And we see some of the ways we're doing that even tomorrow through Brown, Brown Bag, uh, through opportunities for the youth, through the men's breakfast, through the ladies' meetings. Uh, we're just so grateful for Again, everything that you're doing, the ways in which you're leading and guiding us, and we pray that you would just continue to do that, to continue to go before us and prepare the way, and that you would just align our hearts to your will, Lord. And we just pray this morning that you would just be with Pastor Tom and Carrie and the worship team as they lead us here uh, to prepare us to receive your word together this morning. Again, we just thank you, and we want to give you all the praise and the glory here today, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
time for communion. As you were already told, today we will be partaking in communion together. Here at First Baptist Church, we practice an open communion. What that means for you is you do not need to be a member of First Baptist Church to participate with us. You may only be a member of the big church. Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. So this morning, as we do the first Sunday of the month, we will take together communion. I like to use a passage out of Matthew 26. I'll be going through that passage. Pastor Brian will pick up that passage, and we'll read what occurred that evening with Jesus and his disciples. We will give the story, the word spoken. We will talk briefly. We will pray. And then we'll invite you to take the elements together. If you have not used these communion cups before, they're a hassle. The very thin layer, the top, you peel that back by itself to get the cracker exposed. When it's time for the juice, Pastor Brian will invite you to open the cup to expose the juice, and that is the thick tab. They're a pain, but our Lord's worthy of the effort. All right, so, Pastor Brian. Yeah, as always, we want to remind you of Matthew and what's happening here as Jesus and the disciples are meeting for that Passover feast. But we know Jesus has something totally different in store for the disciples here as he's instituting something new, a new covenant between God and man. And so we see the symbolism in the bread and the wine or the bread and the juice as we celebrate here this morning of what Christ is getting ready to do. He's preparing the disciples for that very thing. And as we gather here this morning, we look back at what Christ did for us on the cross so that we can look forward to that great hope that comes through that sacrifice. And so as always, when we gather together for communion, it's a time where we do this together. We're here as the body of Christ to do this just like the disciples did. But we have an individual component where each and every one of us has to examine our own hearts this morning. And to ask, are we living as if Christ died for us? Are we living knowing that Christ died on the cross? He shed his blood for you and for me. And what that means is that we have a changed life and we have eternity promised because of that. And so as we go through the elements, as Pastor Tom leads us here in a minute with the bread, I would just ask you, make sure to take a moment and just pray. Uh, communicate with God. Ask him, are there any areas in my life that I need to surrender over to you this morning? Because it's a time of reflection. It's a time for us to get ourselves right so that when we leave this place, we're on task. We're ready to share of that great hope of the cross. And with that, again, I want to take you back to that dinner. The dinner, the Last Supper, where Jesus and his disciples are together. And we're going to read again from Matthew 26. It'll be verses 26 through 29. And verse 26 starts like this. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Jesus is telling them, as part of this new covenant, hey, I am the bread of life. The people who were there would have known what Jesus was talking about, what connection he was making. He was not telling them that that bread turned into his body. He was not telling them that his body was made of bread. He was reminding them that he is what they need to be sustained. That his body would be broken for us. This song we just sung, Show Me That You Are Here, Jesus gave this, this communion, this act together to remind us that he is there, that he is here, that he will forever be here, that he will always be that bread broken for us, his body to sustain us. And it's so important that we remember that this is more than just a ritual, a tradition, but it truly is a reminder of the truth that Jesus the Christ, broken and bloodied for us. Lord God, we thank you for the truth of your word. 
We thank you for Jesus giving his body to be broken. Not only to be broken, but to be the bread that sustains us, the bread of life that we may remember forever the price paid. Lord God, as we take this bread together, we ask that you would deeper into our hearts, that you would place this deeper into who we are, that it would never be just a tradition, that it would always be a reminder of your goodness to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take the bread together. As I continue to read on in the passage, you can go ahead and peel back that layer for the juice. It says, <clears throat> Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So we know that this cup represents the shed blood of Jesus Christ. No longer would animal sacrifices need to be done. Christ is that once and for all perfect sacrifice. That thing which even those animal sacrifices couldn't do. They served as just a reminder of their need for a savior. And now we have that perfect savior who came, who endured the cross, who rose again three days later. And we have this beautiful new covenant that we can celebrate in, that we can live in each and every day. But it took Christ's giving of his life. And what a picture and a reminder that is. That beautiful sacrifice, which was made for you and for me for the forgiveness of our sins. And so let us remember this morning that sacrifice and what Christ did to establish that connection for us between us and the Father. God, we are just so grateful this morning. As we celebrate communion, as it was mentioned, Lord, I pray this isn't just something that we do out of habit or ritual, but every time it's something that we pray about, that we think about, that we ask that it would be a moment that we're brought back to you, that our life is refocused and reoriented on that beautiful, perfect sacrifice that was given. And I pray that none of us would take that for granted, that it would be the thing that we remember each and every day as we rise of what was given so that we could have a life and not just here, but life everlasting. And so we just give you thanks this morning, Lord, for your shed blood, for your son Christ on the cross. And we just pray this all in your name. Amen. Will you drink with me? this time we're going to get ready to take up our morning offering and so as the ushers come in and, and do that we would just ask that as we pray this morning over this offering that you would pray with us that the money that we receive this morning is only because the Lord has blessed us so greatly and that we have an opportunity to give back and to participate in what the Lord is doing here uh, in the many ministries and the many needs that not only inside of our church, but that we get to participate in within the community. And so I would ask this morning that as we pray, that you would pray with me again, that the Lord would continue to bless us and use these gifts to reach this community. So will you pray again with me? Father God, we are just so thankful for the many blessings which you pour out, and we see that each and every day. Uh, if we're here this morning, it is truly a blessing that you've given us the air in our lungs. And as we've come to this part of our service where we take up uh, an offering, Lord, that it is uh, hopefully given from, from our hearts, uh, that we hand it over openly to you, Lord, knowing that you can do far greater than we can. And we pray for those that you've entrusted as we look to do ministry, as we look to meet those needs here in this community, Lord, that again, that you will open our eyes, that you will help us to see and to know uh, where we're needed and where these gifts are needed so that we can, again, be your hands and feet, Lord, so that we can reach out so that others might be pulled in to that saving grace which you've given and extended to each and every one of us who would profess Christ as our Lord. And so we pray that this morning again, Lord, that as we give again, we do so cheerfully, and we know again that you are going to do great things. And so we just pray that here in your name. Amen.
It is time for our FBC Kids Church. If you have a child with us today up through fifth grade and they'd like to head back to Kids Church, now is the time. If you're a visitor today, our adult leaders will be back there to receive them, take them back down to their appropriate classrooms where they can learn about Jesus with fun, games, snacks, all that stuff that none of you get here. All right. Well, thank you again for being here this morning. It's a, a beautiful morning. The sun is shining, which is a very nice change. All right. Well, we are starting a new series this morning uh, talking about life with Jesus, walking with Jesus. We're coming up, I may not feel like it, we're coming up into spring. We've got Easter on the horizon. Very important time of year for us believers. But sometimes we as believers get stuck in the uh, big moment Jesus worship. We got Sunday, or not Sunday, we have Christmas. We're like, yay, woohoo! Then we got Easter, yay, woohoo! And we forget that all between the yay, woohoo's are a whole lot of other yay, woohoo's. After all, Jesus lived the entire time between Christmas and Easter, except for those three days. So we're gonna look at some of that. We're gonna look at some of the stuff that occurred when Jesus was living his life before he was crucified and rose again. Today we're looking at the calling of his first disciples and see what we can draw out of Matthew's account. It'll be out of Matthew 4, 18 through 22. If you're using your pew Bibles, that'll be 683. I will have the words up on the screen when we get there, but first, I'd like to invite you again to pray with me. Lord God, we again thank you for the opportunity you've given us to be here today, to worship you freely. Lord, that's not lost on me. Every morning I get here, I get out of my truck and I walk through these doors and I just remember that a lot of people don't have that freedom. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you that we can walk in here freely to worship you, read your word, raise our voices in worship and fear nothing from those around us. We thank you for that. Lord God, we pray this morning that you would speak to us, that you would lead us. I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to me and through me, that whatever message is brought forward, everyone would receive exactly what you would have for them to receive, including myself. And I pray that despite whatever challenge I bring to the message, prepare our hearts and our minds. And we pray, Lord God, that above all, you would be glorified from the beginning of the service through the very end. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so Matthew 4, 18 through 22. Again, that's what we'll be reading this morning. I will have the words up on the screen. If you haven't turned there yet and you'd like to, Pew Bibles, page 683. Oh, there we go. Now let us receive the word of our Lord. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nests, and Jesus called them. And immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Thank you, Lord, for your word. So that's a very small selection of scripture. It's titled in a lot of Bibles as Jesus calls his first disciples. And that's what we just read about, Jesus calling his first disciples. So what else can we draw from that? Well, there's quite a bit we can draw from that without removing the subject of calling his first disciples. We'll look really quickly at key point number one. Jesus met them where they were or called them from where they were. We see many times throughout scripture the occurrence of Jesus going to the people or just being among those same people. 
He knows where they are and he goes. He knows what they were doing and he still goes. He knows when they're gonna be doing it and he's there. And he goes and meets them. He doesn't sit behind some gate in some office and say, when you're good enough, come to me. He doesn't separate himself and say, you folks are not educated enough. You folks don't make enough money. You folks hold a different perspective than me on something. Stay away until we're right on time, right in alignment with me. Instead, he goes to them where they are. Why is that important? Well, would a fisherman be a fisherman if he worked in the middle of a desert? Probably not a very good one if he was one. Right? So to find a fisherman, you go where the fishermen are. Who did Jesus say he was here for? Did he come for the sinners or the righteous? He came for the sinners. Where are you gonna find the sinners? Where there's sin going? In the world. Jesus goes to them, where they are, to whom they are, while they're doing whatever they are doing, and he still is Jesus. He goes to these fishermen who were where? In the water, at the lake, at the sea, right? They are fishing, and Jesus goes to them. Now, during that time, even still today, if you look at commercial fishermen, they're kind of rough around the edges. They probably smell pretty bad, but it's hard work, and fish stink. So they're probably kind of like, eee. I'll wave at you, stay over there. Yet Jesus goes to them and says, come and follow me. He doesn't say, hey, fellers, go home, shower up, get them crumbs out of your beard, and come and find me. Instead, he says, while they're in the water, casting nets, dirty, probably stinky, working, come, follow me, and I will send you to do something better. There was no prerequisite given. We need to get that. Jesus knew where they were, who they were, what they were doing, yet he went to them where they were and called them from where they were. You see, in the beginning, people heard Jesus and they thought he was a powerful teacher. In the other gospels, we read about this account happening where Andrew had heard Jesus with John and was started following Jesus from John. So we knew that they had some idea who Jesus was at this point. But they didn't know he was the Messiah yet. They thought maybe something was special. Now, if you think someone's special, especially in this time, the religious leaders were looked at as being special. They wouldn't come down to the water to talk to the fishermen. They wouldn't call the fishermen out of the water to come and learn with them. We know that. In fact, many times the things they did were considered unclean where they weren't even allowed to worship or be near people who were clean. Now, I'm not saying that specifically with fishermen. I'm saying that with people who didn't meet their requirements first. Jesus did not do that, nor does he do that now. Jesus knows where the people are. Jesus knows who the people are. Jesus knows what the people are doing. And Jesus goes anyway. And when he goes, what does he do? Well, usually tells them to do something. Invites them in. Now, key point number two is very brief, but it was important enough to throw in there. Jesus called them, but they had to respond. Okay, so I read that passage of scripture, and verse 22, and they immediately left the boat and their father and followed him. Before that, they dropped their nets and followed him. How would this story be a little different if it said, and Jesus walked up to them, Simon, who is also Peter, and Andrew, and said, come, follow me. And their response was, I'm working, I'll get back to you.
Or if we read James and John, we're saying, yeah, I don't think so. We're set to be pretty good once my father goes. We take over the fishing business. We'll see you later. It changes things. Now, it doesn't change things in the fact that Jesus still went to where they were, to whom they were, and invited them in to come follow me. But they had to do something. They had to say yes. You see, there's many people who forget that. Whether it's their position on how salvation occurs or whether it's their position on how to live a Christian life, they forget that aspect. That when Jesus calls you, you need to answer. What do we call that? Obedience. Come and follow me. They make the decision to follow him. Then they're in obedience because he gave them. It's kind of like a, I don't know, there's probably an English term for it. It's a statement, but it's an invitation. It's a command, but it's not a command. If I were to say to you, come and follow me, I'm telling you to follow me, but I got no authority to tell you to follow me unless you've given me that authority. And you give me that authority by saying, I'll follow you. Jesus said, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I will have you fish for people. We know the Holy Spirit is present because if, if somebody would say that to me, I would go, yeah, fish taste way better than people, I think. You would have to understand there's a spiritual element to that conversation. So the Holy Spirit works first. God does his thing, he's working. Jesus says, come and follow me. They decide, yes, I'm gonna come and follow you. And then we live our life following Jesus and the Holy Spirit puts upon our heart, hey, I want you to go and share the gospel with that person over there. You know the one I'm talking about. That big guy who's double fisting whiskey shots and drop kicking puppies. Go tell him about Jesus. And we'll say, that guy's a freak. I ain't going over there. So we don't respond. Jesus knows who he's sending you to. He knows what that person's into. He knows what that person's doing. He goes to them where they are. I've told you guys, I don't even know how many times now. One of the scariest times in my life had nothing to do with combat. It had to do with telling a little girl on a swing that Jesus loved her. God knew who this little girl was. God knew that she knew that Jesus loved her. He knew all that. He knew her life. And he sent me anyways, and I was terrified, and I didn't want to do it, and I fought it. And when I finally did it, I found out that she knew that too. I went and told her, Jesus loves you. Yeah, I know, duh. Like, what? Okay, sometimes you're doing what God tells you to do, not for that person, but for yourself. He knows where he's sending you. Are you gonna be obedient and respond to his leading? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Are you going to respond to his leading? When he calls you and says, hey, come follow me. That's not a come follow me and then sit still. He's not saying come be part of my club and find the comfiest seat on the couch and just hang out in the clubhouse. Instead, he's saying when you decide that you wanna follow me and you get up and you follow me, I will make you fish for people. We go to key point three. Jesus called them to action, not passivity, not comfort. Why were fish, fishermen chosen here? Well, there's several conversations that can be had. You see the correlation? Fishing for fish, 
fishing for people. I read the other day uh, a beautiful example that it just, it just caught me. It's simple. And I've preached about this kind of before. When we fish nowadays, there's lures for everything. There's lures for everything. Water temperature, species of fish, type of lake, vegetation or no vegetation, rocky bottom, sandy bottom. There is lures for everything. Artificial things to trigger a bite from the fish you are targeting. So much so that you can say, I'm fishing for bass, I don't want any of those carp, I gotta keep it at this level in the water in this presentation. Or I want a carp, which is a bottom feeder. I don't want these other fish, so I'm gonna fish with this bait at this location to make sure I get what I want. That's not how fishing was back then, folks. It was, I'm making my net, I'm gonna go to the water's edge or get on a boat into the water, and I'm gonna throw this heavy weighted net, watch it make a big circle, splash down, and as it's sunk, I'm gonna reel it in as fast as I can, and I hope there is fish in it. I may have a bass, I may have a walleye, I may have bluegill, I may have a carp, but I got stuff in there. Successful trip. I may do the same exact thing. I may make that net, spend hours making this net, get out there on the water, and I may cast that net out as far as I can, and I may reel it in as fast as I can, as hard as I can, I'm sweating. I get to the boat, I pull it up and it's empty. Same amount of effort was required. The catch was not the same. Fishermen understood this. They continued to fish because they understood this. One more cast may be the cast that brings in the beautiful catch. I'm not gonna pick and choose who I share the gospel of Jesus Christ with. Instead, I'm gonna cast the net of truth and I'm gonna reel it back in. And what comes with me is what the Lord has brought to me because he put me where he wanted me to go. He said, go cast your net over here And what's caught is because he told me to cast there. I still have to work. I still have to cast that net. I still have to reel it in. I still have to repair my net. Now, we just talked about this. Jesus knows where they are, who they are, what they do. And he sends you where he wants you because he knows you and he knows what he wants you to do. We're not looking at the story this morning, but you all recall when Jesus told them, hey, after a night of unsuccessful fishing, eh, cast over that side. They haven't caught anything. And this person yells, cast this side. They cast over the other side, and they almost sink their boats. Jesus knows. You still have to do the work. Jesus is Jesus. He could have said, hey, guys, Snap your fingers three times and click your heels and your boat will be full of fish. And they could, and that boat would be full of fish. Instead, he said, do the work, cast your net and watch it be filled. There's a saying, you miss every shot you don't take. You miss every fish you don't cast for. Every cast you don't throw are fish that are gone. And if you're a fisher of people, what does that mean? It means every time you are led to cast the gospel truth into a location that you do not do, those fish, those people, swim away. Now I believe, because of how scripture words things, that God will still get his people. He will still cast that out. But you will have to stand there and say, Sorry, God, I know you wanted me to cast out so that they could come to you earlier, and I didn't because I was scared. You're gonna have to answer for when you're active or not, but we see here that he calls these men not to a comfortable life, but to keep working. 
get up and follow me. They dropped their stuff and they followed him. They didn't follow him expecting to have, oh, I get to sit here and do nothing. They knew they had to work. They were becoming fishers of people. They knew what that meant to them. And using this example, I remind us, how do you maintain your net as a fisher of people? Well, several ways. One is knowing this. See, and this is probably getting a little too in the weeds for you, but one of the problems with net fishing is also one of the benefits. It's indiscriminate in what it catches. You cast it out and what is in there gets caught. But sometimes what gets caught shouldn't be in the net at that time. And I may be fishing for tuna and I cast that out and I get a shark that tears it up. Well, if I know how to repair the damage that's been done, I get my neck back in action. What does that look like for people? There are people who are highly religious that are not followers of Jesus Christ. There are people who are incredibly intelligent that are not followers of Jesus Christ. I am a regular guy. There will be people, there has been people who have said to me challenges that I look at them and go, by faith alone, that the word of God tells me, if you don't believe the word of God, I can't convince you otherwise. I'm not gonna argue with your intelligence. I've had times I've referred conversations to people much smarter than me. There are many um, scientists who study creation that love to get in conversation with evolutionists and, and other people, and they will debate academically, intelligently, their thoughts and positions. I am not one of them. You could tell me that when a blue cell hits a red cell, it turns turquoise. And I would go, huh, Google? I don't know, I'm not gonna argue with that. But what I can tell you is, hey, I give this authority in my life. This tells me an account of creation, and that's what I believe, because I see that scripture is true, and I see how other people who are much smarter than me can even show points to that. And I say, I believe. When I'm able to say that, I'm no longer ripping my neck going, oh, that's true. Well, what about this? And I'm doing more damage. No, oh, instead, I repair my net. Lord God, you know, I, I didn't know how to answer that. You sent me and I did it. My faith strengthens a little bit more. My net gets a little bit tighter, a little bit stronger. As Christians, many times we fall into this category of, ah, I know where I'm going. And that's good enough. Or we get the other mindset of, he'll get his anyways, I don't have to do it. Or maybe even not that extreme, maybe it's, I'm not good at talking in public, I'm not good at talking to people about this. Boy, I really don't know scripture if they have questions. And instead of getting the scripture to help answer those questions, we say, somebody else knows better. And we go back to doing what we want to do. Whatever we're comfortable with, whatever we're used to. We see time and time again in Scripture that Jesus goes to where the sinners are. And is Jesus despite what the sinners are doing. Jesus was called out by the religious leaders. <laughs> Your followers are sinners and you're just gonna be there with them? We have people go to Jesus' followers. Why does your teacher sit and have dinner with these sinners and these tax collectors? How can he be a part of this? Oh, he's there, he must be condoning it, right? He's with them. Jesus knows where he's at. Jesus knows to whom he needs to speak to. He knows what these people are. And he's called on each one of us when he said, come and follow me. And you said, you're my savior. Forgive me. That's you saying, I drop my nets and I follow you. And he says, now, now you are fishers of men, fishers of people. Go to where the people are that need to be caught in the net. Go to where they are. Don't wait for them to come to you. 
Don't sit at the edge of the pier and you see the little bluegill babies sitting there and you drop your net and try to catch these little fish that'll swim right through your net. Instead, listen when he says, go cast your net over here. Go love these people who are used to being rejected, who think that I'm a joke. You go to them and you cast the net of the gospel and you watch what I catch. If you're too good for that, we got problems. If you're too lazy for that, we got problems. He called fishermen. And he uses the example, and I mentioned it already. He uses it in scripture. These guys knew how to fish. And when Jesus came back to them, he said to them, cast on the other side. They cast on the other side, filled their boat. Go where he tells you to go, cast where he tells you to cast, and be ready to reel that net in. It may be empty. There may be one fish in there. It may be overloaded. When those nets are overloaded, it's a revival, even if it's 10 people. You're called to action, to be active for Christ. He knows where the people are, who the people are, and he told us he's here for the sinners, not for the righteous, they don't need a doctor. Are you willing to go cast the net in those tough places? Are you willing to say, okay, yeah, I said I'd follow you. You really want me to cast the net amongst all these rocks? I'm probably gonna get snaggled up. It's gonna be a hard time to reel this back in. Okay, God, that's where you want me to cast? In order to cast in these rocks, I gotta walk in these rocks. It's kind of dangerous. I might cut my feet. Okay, God, you're telling me to go to the rocks. Okay. That's what we're called to do. We're not called to decide who gets caught. We're called to go and be active in obedience to the places where the people are, cast the gospel net, that they may hear the truth of Jesus Christ and that they may see past what the world sees. We must be active for Jesus. We're gonna pray as we get ready to close out. And if you're sitting here this morning and you know that Jesus Christ has called you out, that Jesus had come into your life, you had an encounter, and he said, come and follow me, and you said, yes, and you dropped your old life and followed him, then you better be doing the same thing you did then today. You better be willing to go where he's telling you to go, to be active as you serve him, to cast the gospel net to the people he wants to hear. Well, you're not being obedient. And if you're here this morning, you're going, I have no idea what you're talking about, but this Jesus guy sounds pretty cool. You're right, he is. And if you're sitting here right now when you're having that thought, if you're having that, you know, I want to know more about Jesus. I, I, I want to have a Savior. Guess what? That net has been cast and you've heard it. The gospel of Jesus Christ is true. That he came, Jesus came to earth as God in the flesh, fully God, fully man, born of a virgin that Christmas morning, that he lived his life and was ultimately killed, hung up on a cross where he died. Three days later, he rose again, conquering sin and death so that you and me could reestablish relationship with God the Father. Because we are born into sin, separate from God. We live our lives as sinners, separate from God. What is sin? Separation from God. A lot of times the world will tell you this is sin, that's sin, that's not really sin, but this is sin. Sin is something that separates you from the relationship with God. The Holy Spirit will work. Scripture tells us what a lot of the sins are. But it is so much more important to understand that it is something that separates you from relationship with God. You recognize that you are living in sin, but you don't want to be, that you want that relationship with God. You believe that Jesus Christ is that Savior, the only one that can make that happen. And with your mouth, your heart, your mind, you acknowledge that Jesus Christ is that Savior. You repent. What does repent mean? Turn from the ways of before. Turn from your sins. I don't want that anymore. I believe you're the Savior. Save me. When that occurs in your heart and your mind and you profess that truth, it is done. You are a child of God. 
Jesus Christ is the only Savior. And that is your moment of saying, yes, Lord, I'll follow you, and you drop whatever your old life was to follow him. It is one of the most simple things that can happen, one of the most profound things that'll happen that leads to one of the most difficult things that'll happen. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will encounter challenges. It'll be hard. But that's why he built the church and gave us a church that we may be together in our mission to share the truth of Jesus. You can make that prayer wherever you sit. You can make any prayer wherever you sit. You can ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior right there in silence, and he'll hear you. If you do that, I ask you to find another believer to share that with because it's hard, and we want to celebrate with you and walk alongside you. Or you're welcome to come forward, and I'll pray with you or Pastor Brian or anybody else. We will sit alongside you, and we will pray with you. But if you're sitting here and you hear Jesus saying, hey, come and follow me, you have to respond. And that is either to say, yes, I will follow you, or it's asked to say, ah, I don't want it right now. But once you do, you better get moving, you better be active, and you better be ready to share the truth of Jesus Christ in your life. Because that's what we're called to do. Lord God, I thank you for today, and I thank you for everyone who's here in this building and everyone who's at home worshiping with us. We thank you for your word and the truth of your word, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you are greater than sin and shame, that we may be forgiven. We thank you for that truth that you've given us. We thank you for the example you've given through your word, that we are to be workers for Christ, approved workers for you, constantly on the move sharing the truth with this world, constantly going to the places that the world says are dark and dirty and gross and those sinners where they are. Remind us of your word that we are told to go where you tell us to go, that you know who these people are, where they are, that we are simply instructed to work, to be obedient, to cast the net of the gospel and watch what you fill it with. We thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Jehovah, there is no God like Jehovah, there is 
Praise the Lord. If, if, if you're not excited to serve the Lord worthy of that worship, I tell you what, folks, figure it out. Praise the Lord. I wanna thank you again for being here this morning. You being here is an act of obedience. Come together, do not neglect being together, to worship together, to grow together, because God is worthy. Oh, so exciting. Lord God, I thank you again for everyone here this morning for the promise of your word that you are faithful, that you are active, that you've called us to be a part of your plan to do your work. Use us to advance your kingdom. Use us that others may come to know you as Lord. And we thank you for that excitement, that joy that we get to have following you. May your peace supersede all understanding. May your joy be unexplainable, refresh each and every one of us as we go about the rest of this week as testimony to the goodness of God. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.